Okay, so welcome everybody to the webinar on the potential of agroforestry as a pathway to sustainable sustainability in California agriculture. My name is Sonia Broads and I work with the UC Sustainable Agriculture Research and Education Program. And my name is Amelie Gaudin. I'm an assistant professor of agroecology in the Department of Plant Science at UC Davis. Okay, so what we're gonna be talking about today is, um, I'm gonna start by giving a little, very brief overview of what is agroforestry and why do we wanna consider it in California. I'll then take you on a really quick whirlwind tour of agroforestry systems in other parts of the world so we can kind of get an idea of what else is going on out there. And then I'm gonna move into the main part of the presentation, which is about the results from an exploratory survey of different systems that we did here in California to find out what's going on here. Um, and then Amelie will also talk about a new project she's working on, and I'll mention a new project I'm working on. And then we'll uh, talk about some further insights from the survey and ideas for further work. So um, as many of you know, California agriculture is characterized by really high productivity. We grow a lot of the fruits and vegetables for the US here. Some of the crops like tree nuts are the only ones grown in, the, in California for the US. Uh, we produce a lot of the country's dairy production. And the yields for many of these crops are really high for, uh, on global standards. We have really phenomenal production systems here. But this happens um, through the use of intensive inputs for a lot of our systems here. And while inputs aren't always a problem, we do know that there can be uh, a lot of pollution issues that come up with them and also resource depletion issues. So we have water problems, as, as anybody in California knows. Um, and this map on the right is just one example of pollution issues where the red dots are where the nitrate in the groundwater exceeds the uh, drinking water standards for the nation. And so people in the Central Valley are having to drink, in some cases, drink water that's been contaminated with nitrate if they cannot afford to treat it and there's other types of pollution issues as well. So what can we do about these issues? There's two different options, at least as ways of addressing them. One is through precision agriculture, which is basically about managing your inputs a lot more precisely, just applying the right amounts of the right type of input and in exactly the right place and time. And that happens through really careful uh, small-scale monitoring. Another whole approach though is ecological intensification. And I think of ecological intensification as a way of designing your system so that you're more intentionally harnessing natural processes that happen in ecosystems, especially biological processes and ecological relationships. Um, and so that those processes themselves work for the sustainable functioning of your whole system. So basically, I think of ecological intensification as harnessing life. And we know that life can adjust, it can equilibrate, it can adapt to new situations, and it also renews itself. So that's something I really wanted to focus on. Um, and there's two different processes that can help us lead towards ecological intensification. One is perennialization, which basically is just adding more perennial components to a system. And then the other is diversification, which is about uh, increasing the system's biological diversity. So focusing on these two processes separately for a moment, we've done a literature review and we find that the scientific literature has documented a lot of benefits from perennialization. So there could be water use benefits, um, especially in the Mediterranean climate that we have in a lot of parts of the state here, uh, where we have the winter rains and then summer dry season. In the springtime is when there's the most water in the soil and when the plants are ready to grow and the temperature is warming up. And perennial plants that have established root systems could maybe take better advantage of that spring uh, soil moisture than annual plants that are just starting to grow. 
Um, and there's also maybe more possibility of doing deficit irrigation in perennial crops. Um, there's also more uh, possibility for long-term storage of nutrients in woody biomass in perennial crops. And then, of course, we know carbon sequestration happens in woody biomass. Um, there's an example of some colleagues here on campus who did a study a few years back. They looked at a farm in the Central Valley that had hedgerows. And um, while the hedgerows only took up about 6% of the land area of that farm, it uh, sequestered about 18% of that farmscape's carbon. So that's a very effective way to uh, save the carbon in your system. And perennial systems may have less soil disturbance, which we know can be associated with better soil health. And then there's the whole uh, thing of structural complexity with perennials that may provide more habitat for beneficial organisms. Um, in terms of diversification and the benefits of that, the literature has documented that there are water and nutrient use benefits. Um, there is more complementary utilization of soil resources when you have roots of different plants that have uh, different structures and different depths in the soil. Um, soil health. So there's some documentation that plant diversity growing in the soil can lead to more soil microbial diversity and that this can help with disease control and other functions. Um, also adding animals to a system can help with soil health. Um, again, structural complexity, when you have different types of crops uh, with different architectures, they can provide maybe more habitat for different beneficials. And then there's also risk diversification and resilience on both a biological level, but also an economic level. Um, and so if we put those two together, diversification and perennialization, we have diversified perennial cropping systems. And that really, in a nutshell, is what agroforestry is all about. Um, I define agroforestry with a pretty open definition. So I consider it any incorporation of perennial trees or shrubs or vines with other crops and or with livestock in some kind of an integrated production system where those components have a chance to interact with each other in some way. Um, so now I'm gonna take you on a quick tour of some other systems I had the good fortune of visiting um, in other parts of the world and we can kind of learn something from that. Um, so first to France, which is also a Mediterranean climate and an industrialized economy. Um, in southern France, there's researchers doing a lot of work on agroforestry systems now. They are especially looking at high value timber species like walnuts, um, combining those with winter grain crops. And so this picture on the left shows um, there's a, they created this soil pit where you can study the roots and other elements of the soil. Um, and in fact, they are finding that the trees in these systems, their roots tend to grow more directly down and deeper when they're growing next to these uh, like barley or other winter grains than trees that don't have these crops next to them. So they are, are hypothesizing that there's better utilization of soil resources in these systems, in these mixed systems. Um, and also on the right, we have again, the high value timber species on a vegetable farm. And there's some experiments going on with different levels of pruning of those trees and how that affects the crop production uh, underneath. Um, going over to Italy, there is uh, work with uh, a researcher there who's looking at looking, uh, putting wild asparagus into olive orchards. And wild asparagus is something that's harvested from forest areas in Italy and is a high value kind of a crop. Um, there's also some pastured poultry in different systems. Uh, for example, on the top, you see some vineyards with geese and then chickens in olive orchards. And those producers found um, definitely different types of benefits from those systems. Um, moving a little further afield to India and Zambia. Uh, so on the left, we have um, a common system that's uh, been 
pretty popular in the Punjab area of India where they have intensive crop production. It's kind of the breadbasket of India. And they've been growing poplar trees, like a short rotation poplar system. The poplar is harvested at around six or eight years for like pulpwood production. And they can grow wheat underneath that because uh, the poplar is without its leaves during the season that the wheat grows. And this is just at the end of the season here. And so the, the poor farmers with very small pieces of land can get more production out of their systems this way. Um, they're also growing citrus with different crops in between, like uh, some of the legumes that they produce there. And then on the right, we see a system in Zambia. Now this is very much different from California in that these farmers often are very poor and the infrastructure is not that good. So it's hard for them to buy fertilizer. And so they have very low production levels and they depend on maize as their primary food crop. And so growing these nitrogen fixing trees in the fields really helps them as they can get more nitrogen and the maize production really increases with these trees. And these trees are interesting because they are very unusual. They lose their leaves during the rainy season, unlike most of the vegetation. And the rainy season is when they want to grow their maize crop. So it's very compatible. So flying back into California, what do we have here? Well, we know that we have three to 400 different distinct crops that we grow. Um, we have all these different perennials and all the processing infrastructure needed for those. Uh, we have a lot of different annual cropping systems and all the processing and infrastructure needed for those. And we have livestock, but all of them for the most part tend to be grown and produced very separately from one another. There's maybe farms with different crops next to each other, but there's no um, intentional combining of these different elements together. And so that's what I really wanted to look at in this little survey that uh, we conducted last year. And so the research questions were, what kinds of agroforestry systems are even feasible in California conditions, both agronomically and economically, considering that we have very high input or high throughput and high value systems here. And I'm particularly interested in looking at commercial scale systems. So um, there's a lot of really great like permaculture demonstration sites and home gardens and uh, urban gardens that are really doing very important things. But again, going back to my concern about the, the pollution issues and the problems we have with our intensive production systems, I really want to focus on commercial scale <coughs> systems. So um, the other questions we were asking is, does combining crops into these kind of mixed cropping systems offer ecosystem service benefits? For example, do they assist in crop production in some way? Do they reduce the inputs needed and do they increase system resilience? Again, going with that permaculture hypothesis that if you design a system that is more uh, like a natural system or self-functioning, that that will be a more sustainable and resilient system. Um, and one of the farmers we interviewed even noted that he really likes to see a symbiotic farm system because he considers that a system that works and he enjoys uh, working with that kind of a system. And we also recognize, of course, that there are, there's probably a lot of reasons why these systems aren't more prevalent in California. And so we wanted to explore more of the challenges and the constraints of these kind of systems and what are the research and information needs. So um, we had really limited resources, and so we just, just did a very small survey. Um, there was no, no way to determine kind of an overall sampling frame where we like, were able to send something to a list of addresses. We didn't really have a list of addresses. We just wanted to find out who out there is doing these really different systems. And so we kind of started talking to some people, and then that led to talking to more people. And so that's how we got our sample. So it's not a representative sample in the classic statistical sense. It's just an exploratory sample, finding out what exists out there and, and discovering new things. And so we talked to 10 people who were like either researchers or extension 
people who work in the ag industry, um, but who don't farm themselves. And then we talked also to 15 farmers. And you can see they ranged from very small farms to quite large farms, although the median size was more on the smaller side. Um, many of them owned all their land, which I think is a significant uh, issue for these kind of production systems. And they had varying levels of experience. Um, some who had do, were doing it with their dads before and some who were just starting out. So a lot of different levels. So I'm going to walk through the different kinds of systems that we identified. Um, there's two systems in California that have been better studied over time, and that includes cover cropping in general, and especially in orchards and vineyards, which I consider an agroforestry system. And then there's also hedgerows on crop uh, field edges. And those systems, I purposely tried to steer away from those systems just because they were more studied already and I wanted to find the more unusual systems. But nevertheless, we still found six farmers in our sample who were doing cover cropping in orchards or vineyards and four farmers had hedgerows. But we also found several additional systems. Um, one is orchard intercropping. So here we see, um, you see there's a young walnut tree there they were you know, just planted and then they're growing alfalfa in between the rows there. So that's one kind of thing where there's crops, annual crops or something like alfalfa growing when the orchard is not yet mature. Another type of system though is actually using the mature orchard um, and growing things underneath the canopy. So uh, there's one farmer growing leafy greens in the Central Valley and they found that they can really extend their season actually for farmers markets by growing in the shade of the orchard this way in a walnut orchard. And then there's a farmer with a very diversified mixed fruit production system that has, um, in this case, I think it's peppers or eggplants growing in between the rows there. So uh, every bit of space is used for some kind of crop or another. Um, there is grazing in orchards and vineyards, um, which is becoming more popular, and Amelie is going to talk a little bit about more of that in, in a bit. Um, there is also poultry in orchards and vineyards, and cats, and hopefully they're <laughs> the cats are staying under control. This is a walnut orchard. Um, and then there's some very few but uh, intriguing examples out there of people at a commercial scale doing these much more integrated multi-story systems, multi-component systems where it's not just two crops at a time. But um, this system was just planted recently, um, but it involves, it involved the idea that there would be these chestnut trees that would eventually form an overstory crop. But in the meantime, there's herbs planted and there's smaller fruit trees, like plum trees that might produce before the chestnuts produce. And then all of this is in between other strips of land that are grazed as well. And so there's really multiple interactions going on here. And so those are the systems that we specifically had interviews for. I just wanted to acknowledge there was also an eighth system which is windbreaks along field edges. We did not specifically talk to anybody about these kind of systems, but um, they certainly exist as well, although maybe not as much as say in the Midwest or other parts of the country. Um, so I'm gonna briefly summarize some of the results um, of our talking with the farmers and the researchers about these systems. So um, as far as benefits of these systems go, I found that um, there were several, there were many farmers actually who did say that they seem to reduce their external input use by having these systems and that they get more of their needs satisfied from within the system. So that was kind of, you know, um, upholding my permaculture hypothesis a little bit that the systems could become more self, self-regulating, self-functioning. Um, and more specifically, people had uh, good things to say about nutrient cycling and soil fertility and soil health. Many people mentioned they seem to feel that there's pest control benefits, um, better water infiltration and retention in the soil, 
and also extending the season and improving yields. Um, and I should say all of these things were just the qualitative uh, impressions of the farmers. We did not take any measurements on the farms to verify any of these uh, particular benefits. Um, and the farmers also noted they did feel like they were diversifying their income and mitigating their risk from a business perspective. Um, and so as far as drawbacks and challenges of these systems, many people said that they felt they were more labor intensive. So whenever you add another element, there's, there's more different types of things to do. And so it, it's more labor intensive. Um, several people mentioned needing to adapt existing equipment. Um, we have a lot of large scale equipment here that maybe doesn't fit in this kind of mixed cropping system that well. And a lot of people talked about the increasing management complexity of these systems. And this came out in different ways. So some people mentioned like having to figure out how to irrigate different crops differently, even though they were right next to each other in some cases. Um, timing, kind of managing the whole timing and workflow of different activities when you have different crops. Um, the time intensiveness just to learn about additional crops and enterprises. And then other issues like um, sheep in the orchard, you know, what do you do with them when you have to move them out of the orchard before harvest and where do you put them and a lot of logistical issues like that. Um, knowledge gaps that we particularly identified included um, people wanted to be able to quantify and also know how to value the ecosystem services from these systems. And we know there's a lot of work to be done on that. Um, people also, they feel that there's water savings, but it's, it's always a little uncertain, like how much, what's the trade-off between you know, saving water because you have maybe a more efficient system in some way versus using more water for an additional crop that really wasn't like a cover crop in the orchard when you weren't irrigating that orchard middle before and uh, now you have something growing there. What's the trade-off there? Um, again, like I mentioned before, there were issues of like wanting to find machinery maybe elsewhere in the world that is better designed for these kind of systems. And then there's some questions too uh, from farmers about the role of soil health and diversification in terms of the actual nutrition of the crops being harvested from those systems. So is it better for us to eat food that is grown in these kind of systems? And I think there's very little research on that. So there's some next steps that we see coming out of this survey effort. Um, one thing is we're considering creating an agroforestry farmer researcher network to facilitate identifying research and having that happen on farms um, and just to facilitate information sharing. And I'm going to come back to that in the, at the end and see um, what people on this call think about that. Um, there is also research needs here. Um, so like I mentioned, a lot of people mentioned these systems tend to be more labor and management intensive, uh, except in the case of pest and weed management where they saw benefits and like reductions in the number of kind of pest control paths they had to take. But I'm, I'm always wondering what's going on in these systems. Um, in systems like say the three sisters, the corn, beans, squash, Trio, we know, you know, and students often learn about these kind of systems. We know that there's specific functions that each crop is providing for the other crops in that trio there. So they really work together well. And there's been a lot of work done on cover crops, for example, in California, cover cropping in orchards, for example. People have really looked at, well, if you have this kind of orchard or that, and what your goals are, you may want to try different species of cover crops and different mixes. And that's been better documented. But what we don't have is that same kind of attention documenting the design of these other systems. I feel like a lot of the systems out there are sort of happening by trial and error maybe. Um, and there's things that those particular farmers are learning, but there isn't a systematic um, attempt yet to figure out which species really work together well do they need to be bred in a different way to work with each other in a way that's different from breeding for monocrop systems? 
and what are the practices that can optimize the whole production and not just each crop individually. Um, and one example is um, one of the people trying uh, grazing in a walnut orchard was asking like, what's really the best forage species? Um, we don't know, you know, they need a forage species that they can kind of clear by the time harvest has to happen because walnuts are picked up off the ground. So they don't, they can't have a clumping grass that will be in the way, but they want something that's good for the sheep to eat and thrive on. So there's all these kind of design questions. So I'm gonna now turn it over to <coughs> Amelie and she's gonna talk a little bit about work in uh, sheep grazing and vineyards that she's doing. Yeah, so we started, uh, we, we, we really wanted to start um, studying those integrated system and, and sheep grazing in vineyard is gaining momentum through the Napa and Sonoma Valley. Um, so uh, in partnership with um, uh, shepherds and uh, vineyard, uh, we decided to try to elucidate what are the benefits and potential trade-offs of using sheep in vineyards, when should it be used, what are the uh, benefits for growers, how much, uh, how, um, how much uh, shifts do we have in, in labor cost, um, and what, does, what, what are the advantages for um, the soil health in general. So we are embarking on a new project. Um, our scope and objective are, are, are as follows. First, we are interested in quantifying the impact of sheep grazing uh, integration into vineyards on soil health, soil carbon pool, and long-term sequestration. Um, can having another level of biodiversity in the system increase the amount of carbon coming back in the soil? Do the form of carbon being transformed from the plant through the sheep back to the soil um, change the way carbon can be sequestered over the long term and what are the underlying mechanisms? A second uh, uh, aspect we're looking at is uh, evaluating the impacts on plant growth, nutrition, and crop and forage productivity. Um, and we are implementing a system analysis where we're taking all those potential benefits and trade-offs, putting them all together to better understand the relationship and linkages uh, in the system and uh, for California producers, but for the, and the environment as well. Um, in particular, we're interested in analyzing the economic performance of this system versus conventional system across different vineyards which own their sheep or are just renting their land um, uh, for grazing. Um, we are appraising grower perception um, of integrated sheep vineyard systems um, to better understand the main barriers to adoption of this practice. Um, this is very important for us to design very targeted research projects that will feed the data back to improve adoption um, of these practices, and then identify what policies and support program might enable um, adoption. So our project so far has four components. Uh, we're just embarking on um, the second part, uh, the second component. We're partially funded at this point, and, and we're actually raising funds. But uh, we're interested in um, setting up a demonstration site in collaboration with Napa RCD uh, with some very serious replicated trials across the tillage and different forage component. Uh, and this would also search, serve as an outreach platform. So this is uh, uh, in partnership with the Napa RCD Wichita Creek Sustainable Demonstration Vineyards. Um, and we have Chaos Sheep Outfit that uh, would come um, and graze uh, the site and, and my lab and others will be doing the monitoring on the biophysical aspects um, of um, the trial. We are currently also sampling in the landscape, so taking advantage of all this diversity of practices uh, that we see in Mendocino, Sonoma and Lake County with defined per site, uh, per sites which have been grazed for a long time or non-grazed. Um, and we're comparing them uh, for uh, a lot of different soil health metrics so we can infer potential offset in inputs. Um, we are tuning up into uh, doing an economic analysis through case studies and scenario 
with uh, Boston University and, and CAP um, in those corporate sites. And we're really interested as well in the social considerations through a producer survey. So right now we're getting started on the two first um, um, components of this project and, and we hope to be able to add the, the socioeconomics um, um, as we uh, raise more funds. So the basically the measurements we're doing at the different sites, we're looking at carbon pools, whether they are labile, microbial, or protected and sequestered in the long term. Um, uh, these are part of some soil properties and health metrics, uh, including soil microbe and, and fauna. Uh, we're looking at the capacity of the system to retain nitrogen in an organic form, and of course the impact on yield and, and quality of the grapes. Um, uh, forage composition and production, which is a major component uh, for improving soil health in the systems. And then through survey, looking at input levels, including labor and energy, um, and do an economic analysis through cost um, and, and profits. So our partner in this research, as I mentioned, is Napa County, County um, RCD, KO Sheep Outfit, um, which are, uh, who are grazing the sites. Uh, the Community Alliance with Family Farmers and Boston University are helping with the survey and the social economic analysis. Um, Shannon Ridge and Robert Siski Vineyards uh, have opened the door for us to, to sample some of their sites. And then Fibershed, who is a nonprofit organization of a whole, which is uh, really trying to value the wool being produced as climate beneficial through um, a new, um, um, uh, by adding value to the textile uh, being produced from this wool. Great. Thank you so much, Amelie. Um, I think that's interesting too, Fibershed as somebody that's, as an organization that's trying to provide more business incentive for these kind of systems. Um, that's one thing that um, we found too in the survey is there is kind of an, a business opportunity here, I think, um, in terms of the management complexity that people talked about um, maybe the answer is not just that um, everybody has to have all of these components and manage them all themselves. Maybe there's a chance for subcontracting kinds of relationships where like the chaos sheep outfit, they go around to different vineyards and um, they manage the sheep and the vineyard managers manage the vineyard and there's some coordination piece in between. But I'm wondering if that's an opportunity for some kind of like business incubation for young people who don't have that access to land, but who can do that coordination piece, um, especially with livestock. Seems like something that's needed. So that may be something to look into how, how we can catalyze more of that. And um, another aspect of the business incentive side for these systems um, looking back at the more common practice, slightly more common practice of hedgerows along field edges, I've actually uh, worked with NRCS and some private technical service providers who have been the primary uh, people planting and funding hedgerow projects around the state. And we all collectively added up that there's only around 175 miles of hedgerows that have been planted in the last 20 years statewide. Now, granted, I might be missing several miles here and there uh, from, you know, private things that never got funding to do them or just doing them privately and so on. Um, but 175 miles, given the size of our state and the size of just even the Central Valley itself, it's not really that much. And so we've been thinking, what can we do to incentivize more hedgerow planting? Um, and so some farmers actually came to us with this idea of looking at uh, the commercialization of products from hedgerows, especially elderberries is something they were interested in. So we just got funding from the CDFA Specialty Crops Block Grant Program to um, do this project that's going to plant uh, <clears throat> elderberry hedgerows on farms and document uh, best practices <clears throat> for managing those hedgerows and for harvesting them also and creating a cost of production study 
also looking at marketing opportunities and connecting farmers with people who are interested. There are actually small businesses around the state that make elderberry products like syrups and jams. And they have told us they are having a hard time finding production from California. They sometimes have to buy bulk products from the Midwest and they'd love to have more California production. Um, and we're also collaborating uh, with somebody in food science here, Allison Mitchell on campus to do a nutritional composition of the elderberries, which really has not been done for the native elderberry that grows here, the Sambucus Mexicana. So this will be a project we've just started and it'll be going on for um, the next couple of years. Um, and so just summarizing a few more insights from our survey, um, we also find that, like I mentioned before, there's a need for more appropriate technology um, and this photo I, I just took straight from the Frey Vineyards website where they have somehow worked up a small harvester here for their grain that they're growing in their vineyard rows. Um, and so there are, there's smaller equipment more available in other countries and that may be something to look into making that available. Um, and so just to summarize our findings here and where we see things going. Um, we do feel that agroforestry or any kind of these diversified perennial systems, they do offer potential for beneficial ecosystem services and they may reduce input use in certain situations. Um, but most models in California are, I feel not yet really optimally designed for the best possible systems performance. So what we need is we need to design, we need to apply design methods and lessons from other areas like cover cropping and hedgerow design to create successful integrated systems with more commercial crops that are used in California. We also need to keep in mind um, there's large differences in the commercial value of different crops here. Some of the tree crops on a per acre basis have really high returns compared to field crops. And so we need to keep that in mind in designing these systems that somebody is unlikely going to want to plant their trees at a wider spacing and maybe reduce the return from that crops just so that they can produce something else in between. We have to work within the realistic economic you know, constraints that we have here in, in our California system. Um, and finally, we're finding that livestock grazing in orchards and vineyards is one type of system that shows real potential. And, and Amelie and many others are moving forward with um, assessing those systems. And there may be opportunities for increasing the business um, opportunities there as well. So um, if you're interested in this work, please contact us at uh, the emails provided here, and we'd be happy to talk to you some more. So that ends the um, presentation portion of this webinar.